Hello and welcome to day two of The Green Recovery, brought to you by Project Syndicate. I'm Joe Coburn and welcome to Can Green Business Be Good Business, where we'll be looking at the challenges and solutions to making the private sector a force for good on green issues. And if that wasn't enough, we've got lots more in store for you. Later today, we'll be hearing from Abiy Ahmed, Prime Minister of Ethiopia and winner of the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, who played a key role in coordinating the global response to the 2008 financial crisis. And Kevin Rudd, Australian Prime Minister at the same time, and under whose stewardship Australia became one of the few countries in the world to avoid a late 2000s recession. But to kick things off, we're going to start by looking at whether green business means good business. And joining us for this session, we're delighted to be joined by an extremely distinguished panel of economic superstars. Mariana Matsukatu, Professor at University College London and Director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at the same institution. She's also the author of a stack of best-selling books, including The Value of Everything. Jim O'Neill, Chairman of Chatham House and previously the Chair of Goldman Sachs Asset Management and a former Minister at the UK Treasury. He also famously coined the phrase the BRIC countries to describe Brazil, Russia, India and China. Rebecca Henderson is a Professor of Economics at Harvard where she's one of just 24 researchers to have been awarded the title University Professor. She's also the author of Reimagining Capitalism. Ayla Crevy is Head of Capital Markets at the European Investment Bank. She was previously at the Union Bank of Finland and Societe Generale and is an internationally recognised authority on sustainable finance. Welcome to all of them and we'll be hearing from them in just a couple of minutes. But first, here's former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown on why international cooperation needs to be at the heart of any green recovery. I want to thank you for attending this conference today and hope that all of you are in good health and safe from the COVID disease. We've got to find a cure and we've got to find a vaccine soon. Whenever I talk to young people before COVID, during COVID and no doubt after COVID, the concern that they express most is what is happening to the environment as a whole. And that is the purpose of this conference today, to investigate what's happening, to look at solutions and to press for change. I've been involved in environmental issues since Rio in the early 90s, the Kyoto Conference in 1997, Copenhagen in 2009, and I applauded all those who made possible the Paris Accord in 2015. We managed to bring in the corporates and bring in cities to a new climate agenda. We created a fund for adaptation and mitigation that is to help the poorest countries of the world face up to climate change. We set ambitious targets and the coastal states helped us as so that we have to pursue vigorously carbon reductions in every country. There's been a hole at the centre of everything that we've done on climate change for the last 20 years. If we only implement nationally determined contributions, we cannot get to the global result we need. When I was at Copenhagen in 2009, there was disagreement on who was to be the chair, disagreement on what the agenda was, and eventually disagreement on what we could achieve. The one central point that we addressed then, but we could not find a solution to, was how countries will feel that they are obliged to implement the national targets that are set, and how these targets can fit in to a global regime. If we had been creating an environmental agency and an architecture for managing climate change in 1945, we would have been radical. These were the years when we understood that prosperity to be sustained had to be shared. When we created new international institutions with power to change things, we appeared to want economic justice and social fairness 
but we didn't include environmental sustainability in our aims. Now we must find an institutional architecture by which decisions on the environment can be made. We know the science can help us. We know massive research has been done. We know that renewables are moving forward at pace. We know that companies and cities want to do more. We created the International Space Station in the 1990s. Russia and America, two sworn enemies, managed to come together to work together. In that space station, there are Russian and American astronauts working together. When Ronald Reagan met Mikhail Gorbachev in the pre reykjavik conference to discuss the nuclear issues, Ronald Reagan, who was interested in Star Wars, said to Mikhail Gorbachev, if an asteroid attacked us, would you come to our support? Gorbachev immediately said, of course. Reagan said, we too. It is the we tooism of working together, of building a future that is sustainable by solidarity and cooperation that we need now. This conference will advance this task and I thank you for your participation. former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. Now, if you'd like to join the conversation or help share the word, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag TheGreenRecovery. Now, in just a few more moments, we'll be coming to our panel to discuss whether green business means good business. But first, here's a reminder of the issue. Now, in about half an hour, we'll be hearing questions from editors and journalists from around the world. But first, let's talk to our panellists. And let's start with you, Mariana, um, because businesses are constantly flaunting their green credentials these days. Does that inspire confidence in you that they really are taking the environment seriously? Well, I think we need to start having proper metrics that define not only corporate governance, but especially how business interacts with all the other so-called stakeholders, right? We talk about stakeholder value, but we don't actually look at the relationships. So, you know, COVID, I think, is the perfect testing ground because you have, uh, you know, billions or trillions globally going into the economy from the public sector to sort of save the system, but we have to avoid what happened with the financial crisis, which is that money went in without conditionalities for business. So instead of talking about what business has to do, reforming and rethinking the partnerships themselves. So, for example, public investments, even without talking about COVID, so any sort of you know, public investment, for example, in drug innovation or in renewable energy or in different types of subsidies um, and guarantees that companies get should be conditional, in fact, on transformation of those companies. And what we've seen, well, transformation towards achieving societal goals, right? More inclusive growth, more sustainable growth. And under COVID, I think it's been fascinating how we've seen some of that in countries like France, where Macron was actually quite uh, bold when he said that we're not here to save industry, but to transform it so that the support that both Renault and Air France received was conditional on those uh, sectors actually reducing their carbon emissions. Whereas, for example, in the UK, we just gave a massive giveaway to EasyJet. Right. Well, on that point, Rebecca, you're nodding your head. Do you agree with some sort of conditionality uh, for companies and metrics to actually measure whether they are doing the right thing in terms of the environment, not just saying it is or, or having some sort of advertising to back it up? I completely agree. But I think it's also important to remember that companies have a strong business case in many industries for moving in this direction and that metrics are important not only to see if that they're living up to their commitment to national governments but also to inform their shareholders their customers and their employees as to whether they're really making progress auditable replicable material metrics are fundamental if we're going to transform the the economy right Ayla, do you agree with that uh, yes, uh, thank you. I very much agree with that. I mean, in, in the EU, we are working on metrics on, on, on uh, 
some of these activities, some coming, some uh, some more coming in the future years. What sort but of metrics? Yes. What sort of metrics are you working on? Well, I'm I'm talking about the EU taxonomy, which is defining what kind of activities are aligned with the climate goals, for example, that we have, and other environmental goals. Right. I mean, Jim, I heard Mariana there say the UK could do a lot more. But when it comes to green investments providing strong returns, it is true, isn't it, that sometimes making green business decisions are more expensive? Um, and isn't it reasonable for businesses to prioritise their profits over their green credentials? Um, that probably would have been an easier thing to go, go with five years ago, certainly 10 years ago. But uh, amongst the fascinating things going on with markets during COVID uh, is growing signs that uh, company leaders strongly demonstrating uh, innovative ways of dealing with the green challenge or the, the climate challenge are being rewarded. Um, no better example, although it's got its own oddities, of course, of Tesla in the auto sector, which notwithstanding the big declines of the past week, is massively valued relative to conventional auto producers. And then and the other example is, is directly within uh, the oil produce or the traditional oil producing sector. Shell became uh, a distinguished leader of the British uh, sector. And then very interestingly, again, particularly during COVID, uh, BP, uh, I, I think, was actually uh, uh, in its latest uh, quarterly earnings guidance or statement uh, was basically uh, commended by Greenpeace uh, for the shift it was making. And partly because of that, its share price rose by 5%. Right, Rebecca. So I think we've entered that sort of rather nice position where it's sort of almost becoming a direct financial incentive. Uh, and, and we need to think of ways... Of, of more smart interventions to add to that, that, that companies see it's the source of, source of future value and excitement. Well, everyone wants to come in. Rebecca, what did you want to say? I love Jim's optimism, <laughs> and there are certainly cases where firms are being valued for their investments. But for many firms, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic and perhaps a massive global downturn. And so sometimes, absolutely, firms are being forced to make non-green decisions, to make brown decisions. And I think that's why, exactly as Jim hinted at, we also need government policy to make sure that firms have incentives to do the right thing. Uh, yes, there's movement. Yes, investors are excited. But my goodness, there's a large number of firms for whom ESG and environment is still very much uh, a second thought. Jim? Um, I mean, I, that indeed is what I, I'm hinting at. And I've written... Uh couple of pieces, uh, in fact, one, sadly, not via Project Syndicate just yesterday, but certainly uh, more than one over on Project Syndicate in recent weeks uh, in the past few months, all about how uh, any, any government that's considering state uh, support mm. uh, to help the private sector to recover from COVID, and it goes back to Mariana's opening comment, should be completely conditional on credible... Uh, policies and specifically in the UK, I'm a, I'm now an advocate of some kind of domestic version of a sovereign wealth fund, and one of the main conditionalities would be anybody that wants to get any benefit without really credible 2030 net zero emissions uh, business planning, you you have no chance of getting it. All right, um, so. Mariana, do you share Jim's optimism? I don't believe in optimism and pessimism. I believe that the details matter. So just to sort of come back on something that uh, Rebecca mentioned, because I think it's really important, which is that this shouldn't just be kind of a, a stick, right? In order to grow, at least in the long run, so this is one of the kind of assumptions we're also making, that companies are interested in long-run growth, which isn't always the case. In some cases, there's a lot of sort of short-term and speculative and kind of capital just moving around. So if we're talking about those companies that actually want to be there, it's kind of 10 or 20 years time. And so thinking about their long-term growth, not just short-term profits, then actually getting in early, you know, transforming your value chain properly in a green direction, which is currently kind of a choice, but will very soon be mandatory, they're gonna have a head start. Because what we know that actually characterizes innovation dynamics are dynamic increasing returns to scale. So in other words, 
you know, you can actually build advantage and, you know, get lower costs and innovation leads to future innovation. So those companies actually okay. doing it now are potentially, you know, really kind of investing in their long run competitiveness. But the other thing is just coming back to those conditionalities, just to give you a really concrete example in Germany, pre-COVID, when the steel sector there asked to get bailed out and steel, just I'm sure everyone knows globally, continues to be asked to uh, get bailed out, there are strong conditions that steel lower its material content. And so the loans they got, for example, from their public bank, the KFW, was conditional on that. And today, steel in Germany is one of the most innovative steel sectors. They reduced their material through repurpose, reuse, recycle, not because they went to Davos and said, oh, we need to be stakeholder value driven, but okay. because the loan they received was conditional on that transformation. Let me bring Ayla in. What do you have to say on this? Yes, I think the question is not so much that do businesses have, uh, can they afford it, can they afford it now? It's more like uh, how can they afford not to? And yes, let me take an example. Let's say around 40, 50 years ago, perhaps, uh, at least in Europe, um, it, it became forbidden to dump your waste into the sea. This is what everybody had been done. Industrial corporates, they just dumped their waste into the sea. And one day it was forbidden for obvious reasons. And I don't think, uh, I don't remember, but I don't think this was preceded by a discussion. Can you afford it now? Would you like to have five more years to do this? Or would you have like to have 10 more years? It was decided that this is not acceptable anymore. You can't, you have to treat your waste yourself. Yes, there was an additional cost. Maybe it also created some new jobs, by the way, on the waste treatment side. But this is uh, just another thing now coming on a much larger scale than we used to have, for example, this example. And it is another parameter that you just have to integrate into your business model. I think I don't think you have choice, but I do agree with the, with the previous speakers here that those who do it voluntarily and who do it in advance, they are the ones who gain. But everybody will have to do it ultimately. It's just a, will you want to save some money for the next couple of months and make a quick buck and then suffer more late? Well, we're gonna... uh, later, or do you, do you do you do it now? And we'll talk about short-termism term in a few moments. But, uh, Rebecca, isn't the reality that when we speak about businesses reducing CO2 emissions, there are actually a relatively small number of companies who make all the difference? I mean, for example, according to CDP's Carbon Majors report, 71% of emissions have come from just 100 companies since 1988, specifically fossil fuel providers. It is indeed the case that there are roughly 100 companies who generate products that provide the majority of their emissions. But one of the things we need to do is change the behavior of the people who buy their products so that there's lower demand for them. Really reducing carbon emissions requires transforming not only the energy sector, but also agriculture, materials, transportation. As long as there's strong demand for fossil fuels, the companies are going to keep producing them. Right. So, yes, I think we need to focus on those big 100 and really push them to have concrete plans for the transition. But we also need to focus on their customers so that we're moving the entire economy in a more sustainable, greener direction. But what sort of scale, time scale, are you talking about then if you are trying to change consumer demand in that way? Oh, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we need it to happen really fast. I mean, your but video can you reminded make it? us... Or, Gordon Brown reminded us we need to cut emissions in half by 2030. Mm. We have to try. I spent the first 20 years of my career as the Eastman Kodak professor at MIT. I studied these kinds of fundamental transformations in large firms. And Elia and Mariana are, of course, quite correct. Those firms that go first, that are willing to make that leap, often reap the returns. But my goodness, that's a tough transformation, which is not to say we shouldn't try, but we have to be very careful, as Mariana said, about the details, like who is going to do what by when, because we need to move so fast. And we also need a massive social, political and cultural movement. Let me just throw that in yes. to, uh, to really make this happen. You, you, you go ahead. It is transformational. Um, I suppose there'll be many people that will say, Jim, you've got to bring people with you. Um, and maybe there's a disconnect then between the sort of time scale that Rebecca is talking about and, and the sort of reality. Um, Gordon Brown spoke about international cooperation. When we look at the current political mm. climate, I mean, do you think that sort of cooperation is possible? Uh, let's just say it might be a bit easier if there were a change in the US in November. I mean, you know, one of, putting it in its context, uh, one of the, the main disappointments for me about COVID is, is this horrible contrast 
between the fabulous uh, global coordination in 08, which Gordon Brown was in the center of, and, and the, the absence of even a G20 communique when the G20 leaders met in April. Uh, and so, you know, they're struggling to agree staggeringly and worryingly on equitable COVID vaccine distribution as and when we get one. So under Trump, it's impossible to to seriously pursue what Gordon's rightly on about. Right. I mean, uh, but let, let me just add a couple of other things to throw into yeah. the mix here. And I know one of them, Mariana, would, uh, would probably have a lot of sympathy for. And I, I, I slightly worry some of this is a bit echo chamberish amongst us. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think if whatever country and the EU could consider doing this, let, let me put it to the representative of the EU too. Why not introduce a ban on share buybacks for any company uh, unless it's uh, got a credible um, 2030 emissions target, for example. All right, well, let me put uh, that... That, let that, me, that let is an equally, equally horrible market failure of modern capitalist economics uh, in the same way that environmental right. problems are a result of climate change. Well, let me put that to Ayla. Uh, well, I'm not in charge of this, uh, these this policies in the EU, but I mean, uh, I think there have been such uh, measures in the, in, in the individual countries, for example, uh, that, that buybacks uh, should not happen. But um, uh, I think all of these kind of measures, they should be indeed, uh, as you said, on a more global basis than just in the EU. I mean, we are trying hard in Europe on certain measures, but, uh, but unless you get uh, the global scene uh, to go together, it's, it's, it's going to be very, very tough. Mariana? Well, I think, you know, one of the optimistic bits, just coming back to the pessimism, optimism, is that we're actually living through a semi-martial moment uh, period in Europe. There's a massive recovery package. And that recovery package, for the first time, is not conditional on countries cutting their deficits, the kind of old Troika line. It's actually <laughs> conditional on making investments. Uh, around climate, so climate uh, you know, change uh, focused policies, but also digitalization and health. And so this is interesting because this is a different type of conditionality. This is kind of like public to public, not just public and private. And I think the way to really complement that would be again to bring it back to what do we actually mean by ecosystem and partnership in this battle within Europe. And this issue about you know, share buybacks, I think it's the kind of more umbrella issue is value extraction. So there's many companies that are extracting value, not necessarily creating it, using, for example, tax havens to dodge you know, their tax bill, which of course then gets used for public health, public education, public transport. So they're really, you know, it's, it's sort of a crime in some ways <laughs> to humanity. And so it was interesting that in Denmark, again, they introduced just very recently some, again, conditions that those companies using tax havens will not be eligible for different types of COVID-related buybacks. And Elizabeth Warren in the U.S. put forward exactly what Jim was talking about, which is that it should also be conditional on, you know, reinvesting your profits, not extracting them, so limiting, if not banning, share buybacks. All but, right. you know, if you look at how many share buybacks, well, how much share buybacks has kind of gone up exponentially in the last decade, it's crazy. So $4 trillion worth have been used for share buybacks from the Fortune 500 companies. Many of these companies are in the energy sector and the pharmaceutical sector. And when right. you ask them, why are you doing it? They say, oh, there's no opportunities for investment. Okay. So it's exactly the opportunities that I think we're debating right here, right now. A brief pause before we talk about some of the other solutions. Don't forget, though, to join the conversation and help share the word. Please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Um, so I mentioned solutions. Um, Ayla, how much of the answer in your mind to climate issues relies on changing how risk is understood? Well, that, that is essential because... Uh, Risk assessment, for example, in finance has been traditionally about your debt ratios and your earnings and, and so on and so forth, which is fairly sort of easy to, 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 to assess and it's uniform for, 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 for companies, given that the information is correct, of course. <laughs> but uh, assessing climate risk is, is, is essential because how can we otherwise lend to the companies who, we are, supposed to, who are supposed to be coping better in this environment? How can we uh, ask for the right measures to be done uh, so th this is quite essential. And for example, in, I have been involved in a lot of the uh, work in the EU about sustainable finance. And this has been one of the very, very key questions. And then, of course, the other question is that we can't assess the risk unless we have the information. And the information should ideally be uniform. So there's a lot of work going on on this front about what kind of disclosures you have to make and, uh, uh, and how often so that you get comparable information. 
And yet, I get, again, come to this word, which is, sounds very technical, and in a way it is. Hmm. But it is really, really the foundation of all of this, this EU taxonomy for sustainable uh, finance, uh, sustainable activities, i.e., for the first time, we have definitions that, and this is very important also for the, for the public side, subsidies and conditionality. You can't just say that, well, you have to make green investment for X percent of this money. Well, then green can be this, can be that, but now we actually have clear uh, sort of conditions which say that green is when you do this much and you go this far. If you only do this, it's not yet enough. Right. So this, this is a huge part of the equation. and. Indeed, as uh, everybody has been saying, governments have learned some lessons from the 2008 crisis, but now we actually have some tools to implement these conditions. Right, but, but Mariana, is part of the problem the way we organise the economy currently? I mean, can we really expect the private sector to sacrifice profits when they have obligations towards shareholders and investors to return profits? How can we practically change that to something different? Well, I, th I, th I think there's two different issues now. First of all, there's different types of corporate governance structures, and thank God they're not all currently just focused on maximizing shareholder value. There are many companies that have actually implemented for decades, especially but not only in Scandinavia, that more stakeholder-driven notion, so you know, having worker trade unions on the board of the companies and different types of uh, agents which talk about that long-run investment that's needed for long-run growth and then the direction of that growth towards you know, different um, goals, whether it's sustainability or, or, or greater inclusion. But I think, you know, what we were trying to do in the beginning of this conversation, at least Rebecca and I, when we said this is actually potentially also good for your own future competitiveness, this isn't just about, you know, um, fitting some sort of conditions that are imposed on you. If you are a company that wants to grow through innovation, and that is a big if, not every company wants to do that, right? Walmart, Costco, two companies in the same exact business, Costco for a long time has actually been innovating in order to achieve the same profit margins that, that Walmart was achieving just by, you know, paying workers too little. Right. <laughs> right? So there's different ways to achieve okay. profit. Well, and the real question is who's talking about that within the company? Does a company think it's just there to maximize short-run profits? Or if not, what do we know about what's actually going to catalyze long-run growth, especially when we want it to be sustainable? Well, let's, let's put that to Jim. So two things. First of all, in this regard, I want to repeat what I said at the start, that, uh, and, and it, it might be too optimistic, and I like to think of myself as you know, a really objective person, and I agree <laughs> with what Mariana said about But uh, yeah, it is the fact that only recently has the equity market started to distinguish in, in different sectors between those that are being credible about having a, a, a completely different strategy uh, as it relates to the climate change uh, issue. And hopefully that's be the beginning of a permanent trend. So it just becomes some kind of boom. Uh, and it might be, you know, some kind of next major mac sort of macroeconomic uh, benefit uh, to have all of this investment going into it. Uh, the second thing I would say uh, on, on this issue of profit maximization, and it's something uh, I'm proud in my role as chair of Chatham House to be uh, helping uh, Chatham House to become a bigger and leading voice on is what I define as profit with purpose. And, it, and, and we need to, because as big as this is, and I, I've, I've spent a large part of my life the past few years uh, in, the, in the battle towards antimicrobial resistance, I would argue that's equally as big a challenge as climate change. And so we, we, we need to have profit with purpose where instead of maximizing just one thing, we, we de it's, and it's difficult, but yeah. we develop a world in which various goals are optimised and that becomes the norm in business. Right. I mean, and that sounds great, but Rebecca is one of the problems here that companies have invested enormously in harmful technologies over the years and now hold billions in sunken assets, which they can't do very much with. It, Joe, you're absolutely right. And I was going to throw in the converse, into the conversation the idea that cooperation between firms is absolutely critical. That if any single firm starts to move in this direction, as you say, they have all these sunk assets, they have a huge organization aligned against the old business model. If firms can amongst themselves agree that they're going to shift the entire industry, then they can take advantage of the very significant upside, but without any one of them suffering. And I may sound as though I'm completely utopian, <laughs> but this is happening. You see it most often in the food industry, where the consumer goods industries, uh, big consumer goods companies have come together and said, you know what, deforestation threatens all of us. 
We have to get rid of it. More than 70% of the world's publicly traded palm oil is committed to being grown sustainably. You see real advances in beef and soy, or you did before the current administration in Brazil. Um, so I think we have to have cooperation in the mix here as a potential solution. OK, well, you can sound as a utopian as you'd like to. Um, Jim, um, you famously coined, as I said at the beginning, the phrase the BRIC countries for Brazil, Russia, India and yeah. China. Now, around mm -hmm. the world, those countries are often associated with some of the worst pollution. Is it that simplistic and clear cut? I mean, how seriously are companies in those parts of the world taking their environmental obligations? Well, the risk of being uh, provocative, I mean, I, I would say certainly the Chinese government appears to be taking many aspects of the fight against climate change uh, more seriously than the current government in Washington. Um, and that's important insofar, of course, uh, under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, every company, even private ones, has some kind of representation through to the leadership of, uh, of that party. So. Uh, I, I think they are, uh, it, and unfortunately it goes downhill with the other three BRIC countries after that. But um, uh, in terms of really influencing these issues on a global basis, uh, actually what happens in China and what happens in the States, at least for the next decade, are hugely important because probably something like 80% of global GDP uh, for the last decade came from just those two places. And if they are both together really serious about this, bringing back Gordon Brown's wonderful comments about cooperation, I think it would put enormous pressure on certainly every other G20 member to fall into line, oh. uh, of which, by the way, the EU is, uh, in my uh, view, uh, actually starting to prove itself as a bit of a more serious and credible leader in this space than I expected would have been perhaps the case a few years ago. All right, well, before we talk about short-termism, coming up later today, we have our final session, closing the circuit with opening remarks from former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, which will look at how we can transition to green energy. And following that, we'll be joined by Ethiopian Prime Minister and Nobel Peace Prize winner Abiy Ahmed in conversation with Bertrand Badre. Now, let's return to our panellists and to you, Mariana, because I want to talk about this issue of short-termism when it comes to investment and show everyone this graph. Um, in 1945, as you can see, the average UK investor held a share for an average of six years, but by 2015, that had fallen to six months. Do you feel complaints about short-term shareholder capitalism are valid, not just in the UK, but around the world? Does it actually lead to environmental damage? Yes, but unfortunately, we're rewarding that right now. And, and I hate to, well, I was told that we're allowed to be provocative, but it was actually uh, Gordon Brown uh, <laughs> who reduced the time that uh, private equity had to be invested in order to get a massive ca capital gains tax reduction from 10 years to two years in the UK. That was done um, in the name of stimulating more innovation in the UK. I'm sure he regrets it now, uh, and it's not only his fault. Many different countries have reduced, if you want, taxation rates in pretty foolish ways, which have simply rewarded short-termism. I mean, that capital gains tax um, is one example, but you know, we still don't have a financial transaction tax. That itself would have fostered more long-termism. And many of the issues that we were just talking about before in terms of corporate governance structures that are more stakeholder driven, you know, that itself can become a, as we were talking about, a condition. Okay. So currently, if we just both deregulate the financial markets to the point, by the way, that today in the UK, I think only something like 20% of finance even goes to the real economy. 80% of that goes to fire, finance, insurance, and real estate. So that's a problem of short-termism within the financial sector. Well, in the business sector, this issue that both Jim and I talked about, share buybacks, excessive dividend payouts, this kind of lack of reinvestment back into long-run productive structures is actually being rewarded. So, I mean, just coming back to the green issue, we currently, you know, should be thinking about things like taxing material more than we tax labor. All right, well, it's just you're, not rocket science. You are being provocative because Rebecca's shaking her head. Rebecca. <laughs> I really disagree. I have 25 years experience on corporate boards, one of them on a big pharmaceutical company that did high levels of, of uh, buybacks. Mm. And I think, you know, we looked hard for additional opportunities to spend that money. 
and couldn't see them, we would have loved them. Much better to put the money back into the economy where it can be reinvested more productively. On short-termism, I fear that it's too much of a red herring. Yes, there is some short-term behavior, but we have companies where investors are happy to invest for 10, 20, uh, 20 years. It, at the pharmaceutical company where I was on the board, Amgen, uh, we invested in basic biomedical research to a multi-billion dollar level, estimated payoff 10, 15 years. What made the difference was we could describe why the long-term investment made sense. This, again, is why new metrics are so important. I think if you can communicate to investors why the investment makes sense, you can do it. Too many firms just say, trust me, it's going to be better. And so you uh, investors say, show me the quarterly earning because they want to know the company is under control. But I think we move too easily to short-termism as a boogie. I think okay, there are on. many more fundamental okay. problems. OK, hang on. Ha hang on. I'm, going to, I'm going to bring in the others. Um, Ayla, just before I come to you, Jim, you were shaking your head to what Rebecca was saying. Well, uh, you know, I, I led this global review into antimicrobial resistance um, and, and became pretty aware of the practices of pharmaceutical companies. And as I've said, this is a societal challenge which uh, I can easily think and often do is probably even bigger than climate change in terms of the, the known number of people that are likely to die if we don't do something about it. Uh, the top three American pharmaceutical companies by market value spent more money in the first five years of the last decade buying back their own shares, none of whom are active in antibiotic research themselves, than the entire uh, $42 billion we recommended for, on 29 different interventions. So Amgen may, have, may be a very, very special case, but I dispute that too. Right. Um, I mean, Ayla, can I just put to you, do, do you think it's a red herring, this focus on short-termism? Well, uh, I, I, I do recognize the problems that both Marianne and Jim were talking about, but I agree with, uh, with Rebecca a bit that it is a red herring. And often I see that people mix up, for example, short-term finance with short-termism which have nothing to do with each other, obviously. But I also have seen working in a large financial institution who is financing large infrastructure investments that it's, uh, it's, not, some it's not often the, 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 our capacity to offer financing, which is the problem. It is really the demand and has been in the recent years. And now I think this, this, uh, the public sector getting involved uh, for, uh, with, uh, with uh, very heavy uh, subsidies and supports may be uh, important in the sense that and what we have been doing over the past few years as well is providing risk-taking capacity because somebody might be willing to invest, but banks, for example, <coughs> yes, they have been trimmed now, their balance sheets after the financial crisis, but that has also mean, meant that banks' risk-taking capacity is much lower than it was 10, 15 years ago. And they say so themselves, yes, we can provide liquidity, it's, uh, it's uh, cheap, but we can't put much capital to it. And this is what the public sector and, and firms like us can do. And I think that is also one of the things in this equation. Jim? Very briefly, you know, I, I, I get what, what's being said by uh, Rebecca and Isla here. And, and I think that the phrase short-termism is, is misplaced to some degree. It's all about risk and incentive and balance sheet management. The way, uh, and, and here in America in particular, the tax system almost deliberately encourages strong yeah. share buybacks to help in boost the price earnings ratio. And it, it's almost disincentivizing anybody on the board of Amgen or any other company in, in bringing it back to climate change in the energy space to take proper long-term investment risk. It's just a lot easier to just buy back your own shares, which, by the way, boosts the compensation of much of the leadership of the company. Right, but Rebecca, is, it's, climate, it's, yeah, I mean, but is climate then properly built into our current economic models? I mean, how close are we to building working alternatives? Um, you know, for example, do we have currently have a better alternative to GDP, Rebecca? We do. Um, there have been a variety of panels led by economists like Joseph Stiglitz focusing hard on how we move beyond GDP to measures of natural capital and social capital and social well-being. I think that's a central move if we're going to solve climate change and inequality. And let's just say, if we only address climate change and don't make the transition just and deal with the enormous inequities in the world right now, we're not going to get where we need to go. So we have to make progress on all fronts and we need better metrics on all fronts. Mariana? 
Um, I mean, I, so of, of course we shouldn't just kind of have these blanket words, short-termism. That's the whole point of then going into the details of things like share buybacks and actually, again, not just saying to ban them altogether, but to see when they're being wrongly used. And it's precisely in the case of the pharmaceutical sector, for the reasons that Jim said, that it's you know kind of a scandal just how much they're being used. The share buyback expenditures often much more than the R&D expenditure. And you know companies like Amgen and Pfizer that have engaged in massive share buybacks, that's precisely the kind of you know area where you could say that the 40 uh, billion budget of the U.S. taxpayer coming out of the National Institutes of Health, which helps produce, alongside, of course, the private sector, pharmaceutical innovation, the drugs, you know, that come out, that itself should be conditional, right? I mean, if you're going to access this huge public investment in drug innovation, then you should make sure you're also not only co-investing, but having a conversation of the kind that Jim was talking about, also in terms of that directionality. Right. And I do think there's an assumption that Rebecca, which you know, I'm very happy to speak to you about openly because I really <laughs> value your work, that when you do the share buybacks that somehow then goes back you know, into the economy. What we've actually seen is that the profit share globally is at record level because what those you know, mechanisms do, it increases profits, but those profits are not being reinvested back in the economy. All right. So we've had a fall in investment at the same time that you've had an increase in profits, you know, especially and not only through measures like this, which as Jim said, the increased share prices, stock options and executive pay. OK, we're going to talk about how we can overcome some of these issues um, in just a few moments, though. We'll be talking and taking questions from journalists. But first, as I say, let's talk about how we overcome some of the obstacles that you have presented. Jim, um, let me start with you, because Tony Blair, via his Global Institute, would like to see the Companies Act replaced after the pandemic so that organisations are obliged to think more long term. Do you agree? Is this something governments should look at around the world? Well, I, I'm going to contradict myself. <laughs> uh, I, I, agree, I, I agree with the spirits, um, but I'm not sure that I really would, would go to these simple distinctions of short and long term. I mean, you know, markets are powerful and, and you, you don't want to disincentify the functionality of markets to, to essentially make them a lot more illiquid and they can't do some of them more few useful things they do and so one has to be very careful but in terms of the spirit of it i completely agree with it which is why as i say at chatham house we are are really trying to encourage and be in the middle of uh, a much bigger uh shifting culture to where business in whatever sector it is uh, and of course bring it back to this one here on energy are truly motivated by their their remits uh, from the society they live in to optimize uh, a number of goals, which, by the way, could include things to do with uh, uh, issues of remuneration and, and, and gender representation and so on. But certainly uh, to get away from just pure maximization of profit, which on a quarterly basis, frankly, I know from great experience, given my time in it, uh, it just boils down to very, very clever balance sheet management and has ultimately, quite often in many quarters, nothing to do with how much is being produced or sold. Ayla, what, where, where do you sit on this? Well, um, I look at it from a pragma pragmatic point of view. I think that society has to set the rules and uh, then you try to make your business and you make your profit as much as you can. But society has to set uh, sort of the limits and one of these new limits that we are discussing now is exactly this environmental aspects and which are getting uh, tighter hopefully and other kind of rules about the tax rules and so on so it uh, we can't be uh, against business business is what makes our economies uh, turn around but those businesses will have to function within certain limits and then you try to make the profit in a fair manner whether it's short term or long term profit mm -hmm. but if you obey with the rules and if you are uh, sort of respecting the society and privatizing your uh, profits and then just uh, socializing your environmental or social bills is not the way to do it. Right. I mean, Ayla talks about it doing it in a fair way or in a fair manner, Rebecca. I mean, that will mean different things to different people. I mean, do you need some more stringent levers to not coerce exactly, but encourage companies to abide by the rules that Ayla was talking about? Absolutely. I think we need a strong climate regulation. 
Uh, I think we also need strong legislation in the social sector. My totally out there idea is that business should be actively lobbying for tighter regulation and better rules. So I completely agree with Ayla that we need to change the rules of the game so that when companies maximize, they do the right thing. And that means, uh, and Jim has referred to this, that means really addressing some of the major institutional problems we face worldwide and the shift to populism and the shift to short-termism amongst governments. So I think that business should be playing a strong collective role in improving global governance on this front. Right, but Mariana, with the best will in the world, um, we're in the middle of this pandemic, we're in the middle of a global recession. Is this really the time for businesses to take on more burden as some of them will see it? Will they be open to these sorts of ideas? Well, I think the problem is that even you keep coming back to the language of the past, which is a burden. <laughs> Everything we exactly. just tried to do for the last half hour is to say stop talking about like a burden, but as you know, the future yeah. and and if you get left out, you're gonna have problems. And one of, I mean, your your question for this part of the session, I think, is about practical tools. So yeah. I would just like introduce one practical tool, which I'm kind of very proud to have helped get through in Europe, which is this idea to stop just having these kind of blanket policies to help, for example, small companies or particular sectors, or even to look at green just in terms of renewable energy, but to really think about missions and moonshots that are much more targeted. So one of the examples we gave in kind of pushing through this new instrument, which is called Missions, um, it was, you know, if Europe had 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030, you could start thinking of that as the target as opposed to SME policy or sector level policy. And, you know, if you look at all the different sectors, and businesses within those sectors that would have to innovate and invest towards that goal. That would include you know, businesses in the construction sector, energy, real estate, food, mobility, et cetera. And then the real challenge for governments that I work with is how do you then redesign all these really static instruments like procurement, grants, loans that are just kind of very linear and kind of focused on little categories to actually catalyze and crowd in all sorts of experimentation in the private sector to fuel, you know, um, possible solutions for those goals. Okay. But these really have to be intersectoral. And the multiplier effect, this is where, again, taking it away from the burden language, the multiplier effect for these kind of mission-oriented policies, which are, again, intersectoral but focused on concrete goals, like getting the plastic out of the ocean, is higher. It's like four times higher than the normal multiplier, which is just kind of looking at one little part of the economy. All right. Well, no more burden language from me. I have been told there by Mariana. Um, Jim, um, let, let's look at how lockdown might have affected uh, businesses. It might have taught them to operate more sustainably, um, for example, deglobalizing their supply chains, cutting back on travel or using new technologies. Is that sustainable, though, in itself uh, for global businesses, particularly on the issue of travel? You know... <sighs> Having been uh, active in, in, in business, particularly finance, for over 30 years and having been in the centre of quite a few crises, I, I'm very trained in this never let a crisis go to waste. And <laughs> actually, I have my own personal case. Obviously, the whole BRIC uh, acronym thing came mm. to my mind uh, within a fortnight of 9-11. So I do think how, how individuals, how all of us here talking and, and how business leaders and how national leaders respond and think objectively and opportunistically during a crisis is probably the mark of the next era. And, and, and you know, there are a lot of things to really worry about about this crisis, but I, I think there are some things that one can see as, as possibly taking us to a better future. Hey, look, the, whole, the whole shift of flexible working is, is opening yeah. up the possibility of true improvements in service sets of productivity, which I think we never dreamt. Uh, we could achieve after hoping for them 30 years ago, and here we are, they're, 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 around, they're, they're with us. Right. Uh, and, you know, I could come up with a number of other examples, but on green policy, it look, I'll say it again, it looks to me as though the markets are prepared to reward those that are going to be the boldest. Right. And, but and, and government should, should make sure that that becomes the norm. Alo, do you think, though, some of the new ways that we are working, so a reduction in flying, working from home, um, I mean, that has an impact, of course, on transport systems around the world too and our city centres. Do you think they're permanent or semi-permanent? I would say it's semi-permanent. I think I've been talking to a lot of, uh, you know, our bankers, our peers, our clients. 
are. We, uh, this is oh, no, no. We've Valusia. got you. We've got yes. you. Most seem to think that this, uh, this is this is semi-permanent. That, yes, yes. So most seem to think uh, people I talk to that this is semi-permanent in the way that we will not go back to our old ways, but we will not stay uh, like this totally uh, grounded either, but somewhere in between. But I think it's it's uh, it's been very helpful to see that this actually can be done like this. But I, I wanted to say about the role of finance in general is that. Uh, well, uh, one thing is to have a political agenda and try to get all the governments of the world to agree on something which is a tall order in any circumstances, let alone today. But finance has started to look into these things. And investors, large institutional investors, they ask questions. Banks ask questions from their clients. What are you doing in the environmental regard? What are your practices? What are your uh, policies? What are your safeguards, et cetera, et cetera? And, um, Ah, Ayla, I think we might oh, have... No, it's all right. We've still got comms ah. to you if you want to finish that thought. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Finish your thought. Yes. yes. So I just wanted to say that now that the money is talking, now I think even the most sceptical CEO who is most short-termist in the world will have to listen just because the large, largest institutional investors in the world are asking these questions. So finance is, is, uh, is actually accelerating this while the political agenda may be much slower to pick up, but I've seen in finance in the past five years a tremendous move. And well, is there, is, are we there yet? No, of course we are not. But I think the fact that finance and the people who sit on the money start to ask these questions is actually accelerating this change. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. Don't go anywhere, apart from Jim O'Neill, who has to leave us now. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Um, don't forget, coming up later today is our final session, Closing the Circuit, with opening remarks from former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and another fantastic panel. Following that, we'll be joined by Ethiopian Prime Minister and Nobel Peace Prize winner Abiy Ahmed in conversation with Bertrand Badre. Now, it's time to open things up to journalists from around the world. We're going to go first of all to Canada um, and the journalist there is going to introduce himself and give his question. Oh, good day. Thank you for the discussion. My name is Ryan McDonald. I represent the Globe and Mail in Toronto, Canada. I cover um, the environment, climate change, uh, natural resources and energy here. I suppose uh, my question relates directly to something that Ella was just saying, um, and uh, it has to do with uh, large asset managers. I, I'm thinking specifically of uh, institutional investors, but also players like BlackRock uh, and Goldman Sachs, who put aside billions to invest in, in ESG plays. Um, I'm wondering, uh, are they not also facing a, a major supply squeeze, and specifically, can they find enough sustainable stocks to park their billions? Rebecca? No. That's why they're looking hard at other firms and trying to persuade them to become more sustainable. It's one explanation for why the leading edge firms are seeing their valuations rise so quickly is because there are comparatively few of them. So the big asset managers like BlackRock that, uh, that I'm aware of, of what they're doing, they're focusing hard on the opportunities lower down the portfolio. After all, from a financial perspective, it's one thing to leap on a firm like Tesla that everyone already knows about and is already out in front, but you're better off if you can identify those firms who are likely to make very significant progress in the next five years. So um, I don't think that's inherently a problem, but yes, the supply of really, really green stocks is limited, but there's lots of opportunity in the rest of the market. Comment from you, Ayla? Uh, well, I'm, I work in fixed income, but uh, the same goes uh, here. There seems to be much more demand than there, there is supply. And uh, then those assets are quite uh, tightly held by the people who buy them in the primary market. So there's definitely room for more and search for more. And every new name is uh, very warmly welcomed. Mariana? Oh, just about to have a drink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, I mean, if I can just broaden out the question, I mean, one issue is what is the relationship actually between finance and companies, you know, because we talked a lot about government before. And the sectors I've looked at, like, you know, the biotech sector, you know, really reveal how finance isn't neutral. So even with venture capital, which, you know, is often cuddled up to be the kind of like the good kind of finance versus, say, private equity and, you know, uh, hedge funds, uh, the fact it was so exit driven 
around buyouts and IPOs actually created a lot of brush. And so again, this does come back to what is the form of finance that we actually want in order to galvanize that kind of long-term sustainable growth of companies. And we should be careful because we're starting to see in the clean tech sector the same kind of dynamic we saw in biotech. And by the way, also in the space tech um, area. So lots of plepos, productless IPOs <laughs> that are rushed. Ryan, does that answer your question or would you like to follow up? Oh, indeed. I'm, I'm also just wondering how, how uh, we see asset managers pricing climate risks into their decisions and portfolios. I mean, is, 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 is there uh, adequate um, space there for them to do such? Who would like to take that? Oh, well, if no one's going to offer, I'm going to ask. Um, Rebecca. Um, it's such a good question that I really didn't want to answer. Um, <laughs> how, you, how you price in climate risk is so much in flux at the moment. The good news is it's clearly a significant bottleneck and there's an enormous amount of energy and attention going into this area. Okay. Mariana? I mean... What's interesting is I find that we don't even know how to do it with much easier things, right? I mean, just thinking about, so I'm currently working with London, a uh, particular neighborhood in London, about thinking how it thinks about uh, investments. And, you know, governments aren't very good, for example, at, at, you know, thinking about the difference between a short term and a long run cost. So it costs more to, um, you know, imprison a kid than to properly educate them. <laughs> and so, you know, that's one of the issues in terms of how are we actually calculating risks in the climate space in terms of that kind of short and long run uh, cost, which Nick Stern, of course, wrote about in his first report when he said the cost of not acting is much higher. And so if you transform that cost into a risk, the risk of not acting is actually higher than, you know, giving it a try. But then the question coming back to, you know, our conversation is how do you look at it systemically? So it's not just about one company taking on a risk, but also how they are de-risked and helped to kind of, you know, take on that higher level of uncertainty um, by, for example, governments that are going to support them. Ayla? Well, I, I, I think there's a lot of time and effort that's going into this now. I mean, DIB, we are working on our own models. Uh, com commercial banks have their own models or are working on them. Uh, central banks are looking at this from the systemic banking risk uh, point of view. Uh, but uh, there is no uniform way of, of dealing with this. It's, it's very much uh, proprietary so far, as far as I'm aware. Thank you all very much for that question um, and answering that question from Ryan. We're going to take this question from Nicole Johnston, who is the London correspondent at CGTN. Um, her question is, what impact is the government's 2050 net zero emissions target having on businesses already? Is that goal still attainable in a post-COVID business environment? Ayla. Um... Sorry, can you repeat the question? I have, I'm, I'm having trouble with my line. No, not at all. What impact is the government's 2050 net zero emissions targets having on businesses already, if any? And is that goal still attainable in a post-COVID business environment? Um, well, I think it's a, it's a tough target. We all have to work on it. Uh, um, I'm not looking at things from that perspective in my daily job. But what I do know that there's a lot of... Uh, effort is going into that direction. I think we have, um, we can't just waste any time anymore in discussing this kind of questions exactly like, sorry, um, can, the, can the businesses afford to do this? I think it's a question of, they, they have to. It's like mm -hmm. asking, well, can you businesses, can you afford to pay your employees? Well, obviously they have to, unless, it's, uh, unless they want to close their business. So it's, it's not a question of uh, if, it's just, uh, fact that you have to deal with. Right, but do you think, uh, Mariana and Rebecca, that the targets are actually attainable? I mean, I hear what Ayla's saying, and you've all sort of said that kind of thing, that it's not a choice. But if people don't respond immediately, are those targets attainable? Rebecca? They're technically attainable. Whether they're politically uh, attainable is another different, is another thing. Um, we face a massive collective action problem. Of course we need to get to zero by 2050 to, um, to s keep our, our climate s uh, reasonably stable and our economy reasonably strong. But individual firms are still faced with some tough trade-offs. And so we need policy and we need pressure and we need collective action to make sure everyone moves absolutely as fast as they can. Mariana? Well, I mean, I, 
I would agree. There's the politics and there's the kind of technical. And on the politics side, that's, you know, I mean, I do think that governments, at least right now, in terms of the pressures they can put um, on business, and that includes transnational organizations, have a really strong negotiating hand. The leverage that governments currently have, because they're putting in trillions globally into the system, um, you know, to a large extent, and many countries also bailing out sectors, that creates actually a potential kind of real partnership, which is, again, comes back to those conditionalities that we talked about before, which are happening. It's quite extraordinary. There is her, you know, heterogeneity um, between countries, and some countries have taken the opportunity to create a very different type of discussion. Instead of just handouts, guarantees, and subsidies, these now become conditional on carbon reductions. And that doesn't mean that a company today has to reduce its you know, carbon, because of course they have other massive priorities because of the very difficult uh, moment that we're living through, but they can sign contracts. There's always a contract for every penny that's given mm. that make commitments that are real commitments. Um, and you know, 2050, of course, I actually think it should be 2030. We have another question um, from a journalist in Hong Kong. Um, if you could introduce yourself and where you're from and your question, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Bayani Cruz. I'm from The Asset in Hong Kong. We're the biggest uh, financial magazine in Asia now in terms of ESG coverage. And we use a lot of the articles published uh, by the panelists uh, through Project Syndicate. Now, uh, coming from Asia, we all know that this is the fastest growing region in the world right now in terms of wealth generation. And based on the discussion, it's obvious there's a disconnect between how we measure wealth based on the short-term valuations of the stock market and the long-term nature of sust sustainable investing. And it can be argued that uh, unless we use sustainable investing as a means of measuring wealth, it may not be able to really achieve what it's meant to do, which is to finance climate change and all that. The, my question is, is it possible to address this disconnect and how? I mean, is it realistic to be able to use ESG or sustainable investing criteria, for example, as a means, as an accepted means of measuring wealth for individuals and for companies? Okay, Rebecca, do you want to take that one first? Sure. My colleague, George Seraphim, recently founded a research initiative at the Harvard Business School called the Impact Accounts Initiative which is all about putting into company accounts the effects they're having on natural and social capital as well as on financial capital. And the early results are incredibly promising. I mean, they show, for example, that nearly 25% uh, of listed companies, the harm they're causing, just the environmental harm they're causing, is as much as 25% of their profits. And for some companies, it's more than their entire profit stream. And they're finding that these measures, of course, there are, we can have discussions on you know, how precise are they, but they are pretty good and they are startling. So mm. I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to develop a set of accounts that absolutely measures not just financial valuation, but natural and social valuation as well. Ayla? Uh, yes, I, I think something like this is, 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 is uh, where, where the future may lie. You put a price to the natural capital, you put a price to the carbon that you use, and so on and so forth, and all of that. And then it all becomes numerical, which you can see. Uh, the, the, the current ideas that one should use sort of ESG ratings, I'm not a great believer in that at the moment because they are so diverse that you can find for any company a good rating and a bad rating and, and everything in between. But this kind of sort of different kind of accounting, which actually takes into account the cost that you have to the nature, to the society as a whole, that's a very uh, interesting perspective. Mariana, do you share the skepticism, by the way, on ESG being a, a sort of firm measure? Yes, I do. And that's why I think the interventions um, that were just uh, provided really kind of would move that forward. But what I would add to that is that, given that the uh, journalists use the word value, I think we need to first begin with understanding you know, or asking, what is value? And there's been this assumption in economics that value is created inside business, and then we just have to worry about policy kind of fixing any market failures that might come about from that. Instead, I do think that the word stakeholder value is really appealing to a different type of concept where value is co-created by different types of actors. Definitely, if you look at the health sector and the green sector, you have uh, public actors, private actors, nonprofit actors co-investing, taking risks, and you know, then they should be also sharing the rewards. But how we actually measure 
but collective value creation is something that I also think we need to be thinking about. So again, it goes beyond just within the business, but between economic actors, if, big if, we agree that value is co-created. Well, Biani, I hope that answers your question, uh, Biani in Hong Kong there. That's all we have time for now. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Mariana Mazzucato, Rebecca Henderson, Ayla Cravey and Jim O'Neill earlier on. Now, don't forget, if you'd like to join the conversation or help spread the word, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag the Green Recovery. Now, don't go anywhere. We'll be taking a short break before our second and final session of the day where we'll be looking at energy and whether there really is a path towards a greener, more sustainable future. We'll see you then and thank you very much for watching and sharing. If we respect the environment, it will respect us. So we all have to play our part. We were really in trouble of losing some species in my lifetime. And this can wreak havoc on the balance of the ecosystem. People need nature, and people must take care of nature. I am part of the next generation that have to make sure that this place survives. It is our responsibility as the two-legged to try to foster good relationships with the earth. And it's beginning now.
Hello and welcome back to The Green Recovery, brought to you by Project Syndicate. I'm Joe Coburn. In a little over an hour, we'll be hearing from Ethiopian Prime Minister and winner of the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize, Abi Ahmed, who will be in conversation with Bertrand Badre, CEO and founder of Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital. But before that, our fourth and final session is Closing the Circuit, a look at energy and whether there really is a path towards a greener, more sustainable future. In a few moments, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd will be making the opening remarks. But first, let's meet our panel of highly accomplished experts from around the world who will be shedding light on the global challenges and solutions on this vital issue. Let's start with Jules Kortenhorst, is the CEO of the Rocky Mountain Institute, a non-profit think tank which aims to help companies, communities and institutions to make the shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Laurence Tubiana is CEO of the European Climate Foundation. Previously, she served as France's climate change ambassador and is recognised as one of the key architects of the Paris Agreement. José Antonio González Anaya is the former Minister of Finance and Public Credit of Mexico and the former CEO of Pemex, Mexico's national petrol and oil company. Omran al Khawari is the CEO of Qatar Foundation International. He previously worked in various gas and oil companies, including Qatar Gas, Qatar Petroleum, ExxonMobil, Green Gulf and Enterprise Qatar. But first, let's remind ourselves of what's at stake. Now, if you'd like to join the conversation or help spread the word, please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Now, though, here's Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. Well, folks, here we are in the midst of the COVID crisis and the great global recession, which has followed it. It's one giant uh, cluster F, uh, to use the technical macroeconomic term. The key question for those of us concerned about the planet is uh, what do we do to engender a genuine green economic recovery? The energy sector generates one third of global greenhouse gas emissions. If we tackle the energy sector, then we're going to make a huge uh, impact in terms of our ability to keep global temperature increases within 1.5 degrees centigrade. There's some encouraging news. Number one is candidate Biden's promise that the United States would produce a decarbonised national electricity grid by 2035. And just to put that into its context, no American state at this stage has that commitment. Candidate Biden has also committed to the United States being net carbon neutral by 2050. These two undertakings form an enormous basis upon which we can see a clean energy revolution across the United States. Of course, globally, it ain't all as rosy as that. To put that into context, that's bigger than the current entire fleet of such stations within the United States. There are some positive things happening in China as well. They're making moves towards a carbon price. We also see initiatives in terms of electric vehicles. We see electrical vehicle charging stations across the country. If Biden's elected, whatever may happen in the rest of the US-China relationship, it is in the planet's interest that China and the United States resume collaboration on combined climate change action. 
Governments can make a difference. I was Prime Minister of Australia during the global financial crisis and we made three big decisions as far as the environment were concerned. We legislated for a mandatory renewable energy target of 20% of Australian energy supply by 2020. And guess what? That's come in on time. We're now at 21-22% renewable in this country, having started with only four. We also undertook what we call the Energy Efficient Homes program. Insulation into houses needing either heating or cooling and that resulted in insulation in 20% of the nation's housing stock. We subsidised solar panels on about 20% of the nation's housing stock as well. These measures in aggregate helped contribute to a 10% real reduction in Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. So turning to the future and a global green economic recovery, I'd suggest the following steps. Number one, targeted investments in renewable energy projects. Number two, invest in large scale energy infrastructure projects, which of themselves transform the nature of the stationary energy sector. Three, invest in the decommissioning of existing coal-fired power stations, which are ready for the scrap heap anyway. Four, invest again in R&D, because unless that happens, we're not dealing effectively with the big other renewable energy options and energy efficiency options for the future. I believe we can do that and do it in a way which actually generates not just good stuff for the environment and the planet, but generates a bunch of jobs and contributes to economic recovery at the same time. The makes is less of a cluster F than it would otherwise be. Good to be with you. So that was Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. Now in about half an hour, we'll be hearing questions from editors and journalists from around the world. But now it is time to open up our discussion about greener energy. And Laurence, I'd like to start with you because you were strongly involved with drafting the Paris agreements. When you look at the energy sector today, do you feel the word is likely to meet the targets you devised? Uh, we have a mixed picture. On one side, of course, we still have, as Kevin just said, that the, the amount of fossil fuel in the global economy is very high, and China and other countries are still investing in Australia, still investing in coal-based power plants. But at the same time, you see in many other countries, I look at Europe, for example, uh, going down on the coal. And finally, uh, there is an, a huge number of coal-based power plants who have been closed during the last five years. So there is clearly a move to renewable energy. There is a clearly a move that coal is over as a stranded asset now. But at the same time, of course, it's too slow. Meaning, I think the direction of travel is right. right. The problem is that it's just too slow because we have started so late to address the question of fossil fuels. Another good signal, which I feel optimistic was, is that some oil companies, I'm looking at BP, for example, or is now seeing its future in renewable energy and not in drilling more oil. So there are these good signs. Right. But really, it's a run against time. Um, Omran, the, the issue of BP, we've heard this phrase peak oil. Do you think we've reached that? Certainly Bernard Looney seemed to think so. Yeah, I think... You know? uh, Peak demand, I believe, is what BP is saying. And it's a very interesting question. I think it's something that, you know, five years ago wasn't, wasn't even uh, something we'd consider. But I think the point just to uh, carry on, on on, you know, these companies like BP and uh, taking on these uh, certain kind of um, uh, goals to become net zero companies is, is very substantial. Because, uh, is, there's no way we can reach the Paris Agreements without energy companies at least doing their part. And... Uh, Something where, you know, in the past we, we, we hear about energy companies focusing on the extraction process, being efficient and lean. But now, finally, uh, I think with pressure from the financial industry, from policymakers, and, and the populations around the world, there's pressure for companies to go and look at the entire um, emissions, so scope three emissions, if you want to be more technical. And that will really change things because it will, it will drive up investment in low carbon technology, it will also speed up innovation in, in solutions that where you have to really decarbonize the harder uh, parts of the of the chain 
and that will really uh, help uh, support the Paris Agreement. Um, Jose Antonio, is there a problem, though, with countries who sign up to these global agreements and then don't necessarily keep to them? I mean, in the last few years, we've seen the discovery of huge amounts of gas under the eastern Mediterranean, estimated to be enough to power the entire United States for over a decade. So is it a surprise to you that it's become so hotly contested, with Turkey even dispatching naval vessels to flank a drilling ship there? Doesn't that, in a way, indicate the point that, yes, they'll sign up, but they won't necessarily keep to those commitments? Well, I mean, I think one of the problems with when we talk about these things is we, we need to send the right price signals, and that may sound a bit esoteric, but, uh, you know, people love to talk about carbon taxes and everything, and then we ask ourselves, which is your question, why don't we do them? And the answer is it's unpopular. You know, we, you know, it sounds good to have a carbon tax until you have to pay more gasoline for your car or more gasoline or pay more for an airplane ticket or pay more for all of your shipping costs. So as long as we don't have the right price signals, then it be, all of this becomes uh, very difficult to do. I think we're facing an interesting, an interesting uh, area, which is the price of oil has fallen because of the pandemic. So now it's the time to put in uh, carbon taxes on fuels. Oh. Uh, and we see that in Latin America, where, you know, when you eliminate the fuel subsidies, all kinds of riots happen. But today, the price of oil has fallen. Now it's the time not to let the price of gasoline fall. Right. So do you agree, Jules, that this is a prime time to take that sort of action um, in the midst of the pandemic? A price on carbon has for the longest time been one of the crucial policy measures that pretty much every economist agrees on is, is necessary. But there's some good news even in the absence of a price on carbon, particularly in the electricity sector. But I would say also in mobility. We can now see that the renewable, sustainable energy solutions of the future are more cost competitive than fossil fuels. And at the moment that, on a standalone basis, without a price on carbon, without subsidies, the economics flip, that's also when the movement starts to accelerate. We've seen it here in the United States quite significantly, where new wind and solar is more cost effective than existing coal plants. And as a result, the number of coal plants in the United States that has been closed down over the four years under the Trump administration is actually higher than the number of coal plants that were shut down during eight years of Obama. So the pace is accelerating there because the economics has flipped. And if you then put a price on carbon on top of that, you further drive uh, that transition. So yes, the policy measure is crucial, but we should not ignore the fact that in some sectors of the energy economy, we can move forward because the economics have already shifted. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, Jules, because we're going to show you um, and everyone watching a graph taking in um, some of what you said and about energy consumption over the years. Um, this is actually looking at energy consumption by source over the last 50 years. Coal, oil and gas, as you can see, have grown enormously, while renewables have failed to keep up, and that's despite, as you say, the cost coming down. Why? Um, fundamental point, this transition is only just now right. starting to happen. For the longest time, the investments in solar and in wind were motivated by subsidies and a long-term outlook that in due course these technologies could compete. It is only just in the last couple of years that we've seen this very significant shift where, like I said, new solar plants, new wind sites can outcompete existing coal plants and soon will even be outcompeting existing gas plants. Right. That completely, dramatically changes the dynamic. So the curves that you showed, which were so flat for such a long time at the bottom of that graph, are about to go steep up when the economics for everybody clearly to see become differently. Right. Laurence, do you agree that that transformation is going to happen? Is there still a problem, though, with reliability when it comes to uh, renewables? Of course, I think uh, Julie's right. It's just happening now. It's recent, uh, and the investment is finally very recent. So when you look 50 years, uh, in a, this period, of course, you don't see the evolution. When you look at the 
10 last year, then you see the evolution very clearly. So that's one. Second, if you want people to not to use oil or gas and to, to have something else, you have to offer the alternative and they are ready and they are available. And I do see now the, the progress, and that's true, for example, for electric vehicle, if you want to shift from combustion engine to electric vehicle, you have to have the charging system in place. So the price is, is good and important, but the infrastructure is absolutely, absolutely key. What I do see now is that uh, what we see is uh, the acceleration of this path, again, because as Jules said, the prices are going down. But now, now uh, the problem is that in the recovery phase we are in, which is the topic of this panel, we have to make sure that we are not maintaining stranded asset and old activities my, while we should be investing even more because what I said in the beginning, we are losing the, the race against time. So that's a key moment to decide to take the right decisions. Right, Omran, you've been nodding your head um, listening to the other two guests, but would you be prepared to withdraw in the way that Laurence is talking about um, some traditional forms uh, of energy in order to boost even further the use of renewables? I think, I mean, I think we don't have the really luxury. To, I think all, all solutions need to be looked at, but I do agree with, with both speakers that energy transition is happening. And it takes a long time. Uh, and, but why, why this energy transition is different than previous ones, which tend to happen every 100 years or so, is that this one is what we call a purposive one. You know, there's a reason why this is happening. And it's being accelerated. We have a carbon budget we have to meet. We have climate change. And I think that will put pressure and, and accelerate things a lot. And then to add on top of that, you know, the, the, the costs of renewables and low carbon electricity is really coming down rapidly. And we see by 2050, 50% uh, of, of all power consumption, by, by some estimates, will be electrified and mostly by low carbon, which is great news. But that still leaves a question about the other 50%. Um, and that, that's where we touch on some of these issues, you know, stranded assets potentially. But also, you know, how do you address the other 50%? Uh, in the meantime, I think power sector in general is something that we see a pathway, as mentioned by Jules, uh, uh, renewables have come down, the, the cost of storage has come down, battery technology has come down dramatically, 80% in the last eight years or so. But what happens to non, uh, the harder to, what they call harder to abate sectors or the harder to decarbonize sectors? And that's why you need to, from now on, start thinking about those through innovation and, and uh, leadership in, in uh, research and development and make sure you have the incentive in place to start looking at, uh, you know, a large scale hydrogen production or, or um, carbon capture if you have to use it, or even net negative emission technologies. I think that's going to be where the focus needs to be, in my opinion, in the next 10 years. And that will definitely touch on hard decisions about what do you do about coal plants. I mean, Asia definitely has coal plants uh, that are being decommissioned, but I think over 60% of uh, the coal plants that are in China or India are built in the last 20 years. That's, that's going to be a big challenge economically. Jose Antonio, what do you say? Well, I mean, I, I agree with what's been said, and I, and I don't want, you know, I agree with uh, all of the points that have been made. But I'm sorry to come back to this. There are still regions in the world mm. where, like Latin America, like the Middle East, we subsidize fossil fuels. We have to eliminate these subsidies. And my point, I understand the problems with implementing carbon taxes, but uh, subsidizing fuels, gasoline, diesels, jet fuels, it just, to me, it doesn't make any sense, and we still do so. You know, in Latin America, to give you an, an idea, it's 3% of government revenue is the amount of subsidies that we have. My idea is that in the Middle East, it's even, it's even higher. The time to eliminate these subsidies is now, because the price of oil has fallen. So instead of letting the prices of fuels come down, you just, you know, put a tax in there, and you eliminate the political costs of increasing the increasing the price the prices of fuel of, of uh, fossil fuels. So I think it's important. It's not popular. It's not you know good news, but it's important to do because otherwise, if we believe and I believe that we're reaching peak demand in some of these fossil fuels, the prices of these things are going to fall. So what's been said about you know renewables becoming more and more competitive is true. 
But if the price of oil falls, it's going to be harder and harder to do as well. So there's an equilibrium here that one has to take into account. That's my only point, although I agree with what's been said, of course. Right, but before we move on, because I want to pick up on your point, uh, Jose Antonio, in terms of different uh, parts of the world using different forms of energy, particularly fossil fuels. But listening to that issue about if the oil price, you know, as it has fallen, how difficult is it going to be to wean people off if it's also cheap, Jules? Well, uh, there is no doubt that subsidies on fossil fuels are the absolute opposite of what needs to happen. And I completely agree with Jose Antonio that now is the time for countries uh, to step back from subsidizing fossil fuels. By the way, that's not just, we often think about that as something that foremost is a challenge for emerging economies. But here in the United States, the subsidies for uh, exploration and production for the, 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 the upstream part of the energy system are very significant. So those need to be eliminated. Uh, the, the one thing that gives me hope is that although that needs to happen and although um, policy is incredibly important, we are also seeing momentum from the private sector. And we are seeing momentum because the economics are shifting so clearly and companies that in the past would never have acknowledged this accelerating shift are now joining the bandwagon. BP, okay. it was already mentioned, a good example there, uh, announcing that they will reduce their own production of oil and gas by 40% uh, over the next 10 years. Yeah. And that sort of approximates what is necessary for a one and a half degree world. So yes, we need the policies, but uh, my story is often about the private sector. All right, will you stick with that story? Now, don't forget to join the conversation and help share the word. Please do get involved on social media using the hashtag The Green Recovery. Um, Omran, um, I'm going to ask you to look at this graph along with everybody else because it's about energy consumption, as I mentioned, in different parts of the world. Um, and as you can see, it's levelled off in the West, but there has been enormous growth in the Asia-Pacific region, driven by the most incredible growth of human prosperity in history. Would it have been possible, that growth, without a huge increase in CO2? Um, and what can be done to stop it rising further? I mean, that's, that's probably uh, hard to say that it, it would have been possible in the other way. I think, you know, the, the awareness of climate change, of course, existed in long, a long time in many, uh, in academia, in many areas. But I think companies, you know, met the demand and, 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 and it is what it is. Going forward, though, I think definitely a lot can be mitigated. I think going forward, there has to be some strong action on, on making sure you decarbonize the power sector immediately. And that may, may, may require some tough decisions like closing coal plants, but also may require some maybe unpopular decisions in, from an environmental perspective like nuclear. Mm. You know, you look at nuclear, um, if we had more time uh, and if we had uh, other options, you know, there are options that exist in terms of uh, using uh, low carbon renewables and offshore wind and solar, of course, and regular wind. But we don't have the time uh, to meet the scale needed. And, and really, we're talking about India and China when we're talking about Asia and, and, and the rest of the world. India and China stand differently. And even the IPCC recognized that there's a need for, you know, two, two and a half increase in, in, in nuclear in that part of the world just to be able to meet the scale. So what, what I'm saying is going forward, yes, it, it is possible. But there will be some tough decisions and maybe not ones that work uh, in, in Europe or in the U.S., it may be, you know, it's a diff very different part of the world. Same, but if you go to, like, Africa, for example, you know, nuclear doesn't make sense. It's, it's mostly rural, and there's ways to meet that. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is it is possible, but it will require tough decisions, and it will require uh, leadership, international leadership. I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're going to shut down these coal plants, who will, uh, you know, how will that be managed economically? Okay, well, we'll talk and, about... And some other issues related to uh, security of supply and so on we can talk about, which will have to be addressed. Yeah, and we'll talk about the nuclear um, sort of part of the mix in, in just a moment. But, Laurence, I want you to respond, because on that graph, we saw Europe's energy consumption flatline from around the mid-'80s. How can Europe go further um, and substantially reduce its energy consumption? Mm. I think the plan is, on the one, really to increase enormously the amount of energy consumed. No, all the scenario for getting to net zero by 2050 implies a reduction of 50% of the energy consumption. How is this possible? Really gaining and inventing and innovating in energy efficiency. Uh, the main source of energy consumption in Europe now are from two sectors, mainly transport and buildings. 
on buildings, really, we are lagging behind mm. uh, because we have a stock of capital builds that we have to refit. And this is coming now. The Green Deal in Europe, this big green pact, is about uh, um, really hundreds of million and billion would be thrown out of fitting building as a major source of employment and a major source of economy efficiency. The second one, of course, is the transport sector. And you know, when you go from a combustion engine to electric electric transport, you, you want a lot of energy and the consumption of energy of electricity is much, much low, lower. So that's one of the solution. The other one, of course, is a change in the behaviors and the, the way we live. Uh, a part of the energy, for example, is consumed through agriculture and agriculture is about the food chain as well. So there is multiple, uh, um, of course, it's not simple, it's one, it's no silver bullet, but there is a different sectors that can use much less energy. But then, of course, the problem is still the source of energy. And uh, I, I don't want to reopen the nuclear discussion, <laughs> but the problem is really the competitiveness of nuclear, which is, of course, a powerful of concentrated energy. But the problem is, for the moment, the unit cost of any kilowatt or megawatt of nuclear is still very expensive for many reasons, including safety. Yes. <clears throat> so, but now hydrogen is coming in, which is could be a concentrated source of energy, like we see, for example, the whole movement of the steel industry now really seeing a zero carbon uh, process possible because of hydrogen, of course which you have to produce out of some source of electricity anyway. Yeah. So I think there are multiple ways where energy is not just a unique way to think about we need more okay. oil or more gas or more biomass. Um, Jose Antonio, can I go back to this link, though, that we discussed with Omran, which is, can the global south really reduce its levels of poverty without increasing energy consumption? Isn't that link quite clear? And is it fair to ask them to do so? I mean, I think you're going to increase the level of energy consumption, but there are ways to feed this energy. And I think what we can do is promote the development of cleaner energies uh, in the process of growth. And we've seen that happening in different areas of the world. But, you know, I, I come back, I guess I'm too much of an economist, I come back to <laughs> pricing. If you subsidize fossil fuels, what are you going to invest in fossil fuels? If you don't subsidize R&D in renewables, I'll give you a couple of examples. The only country in Latin America that has prices of gasoline in the level of Europe is Uruguay. Mm. Everybody else is much lower and most of us are subsidizing. But some of us, most countries in Latin America, have import tariffs on solar panels. Well, you're not going to have solar panels mm. if you have 20% import tariffs on the solar panels. You're not going to import them. So, so there are lots of policies that you can do to create the energy so you can grow. So I am not much, of, I'm not a big fan of this, you know, growth versus energy consumption mm. debate. I think you can get the energy, you can get the growth, but at the same time, you can put the incentives to have lower carbon incentive growth. And so, that I think we can do. Right, so what is the obstacle in your mind then political? Is it just that these things aren't palatable at the moment, that they haven't happened um, because you make it sound so plausible and straightforward? Well, I, I think there was a key to your question is at the moment. I think now is the moment. <laughs> you know, for all the wrong reasons, we have a chance to put the right policies in place. And some of these, I'm not sure if it's political or just inertia that we like to say, oh, you know, it's just gasoline is cheap, so you can take your car wherever you want. Mm. Or somebody has a small plant of solar panels that is not efficient in one of our countries, so we protect it. Well, that's not very sound, uh, you know, ec 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 ecological or economical reasoning to put 20% yeah. uh, tariffs on solar panels or on wind uh, on wind equipment, etc. Right, but what about then the infrastructure question, Jules? Because Laurence has brought up a couple of times transport and, you know, moves to electric vehicles. But if the infrastructure isn't there in countries and regions across the world, people aren't going to do that. You have to have the infrastructure first, don't you? And the companies that you probably deal with might invest and might go for these things if they were confident um, that the infrastructure was already in place. Absolutely crucial point, Joe. 
um, we have to um, make massive investments in the renewable and clean energy infrastructure of the future, and now is the time. We all know that as a result of this horrible pandemic, we're going to have to boost our economies around the world with stimulus measures. And analysis after analysis shows that if you direct those stimulus measures to the energy solutions of the future, you create more jobs, you strengthen the competitiveness of your economy, and of course you address the um, issues of climate change and health. So this is really a pivotal moment where in laying out the infrastructure investment plans for the next decade, governments have to make the right decision. Bailing out fossil fuel companies makes absolutely no sense. Investing in the infrastructure of the future is the right idea. Building new coal plants is really stupid. You're building the stranded assets of the future. Mm. Investing in wind and solar is the right decision. I can go on and on. It's so obvious, these choices. And I've seen over the last couple of months, economists around the world uh, congregating around this idea that the stimulus that gets us out of the pandemic economic crisis has to be a green stimulus. I think governments really have to follow on that advice. And by the way, an inspirational example in Europe. I mean, the Green Deal that uh, the European uh, Commission is, is uh, pushing is the sort of program that we need around the world. Well, Jules, I'm going to um, actually stick with your point. In fact, what all of you have been saying, which is about the cost of renewables. Let's have a look at it um, again on this graph, because you can see that today the cheapest energy sources in many countries around the world are now renewables. So, again, if that's the case, you say it's stupid, but why are people still commissioning fossil fuels? There is inertia in the uh, business system and there is politics. And let's be honest, ah. not all of the energy decisions are made purely on the basis of economics. Politics plays a big factor. Just look here at the United States. Four years ago, the incoming administration said they were going to save the coal industry. Well, the reality is that the number of coal plants uh, that has, gets closed down has accelerated here in the United States because the politics didn't work. But it is a slow process if politicians are pulling in the wrong direction. So I think it's very obvious that uh, we need to get the message out much more clearly that anybody who invests in fossil infrastructure is essentially investing in stranded assets of tomorrow. And, and these are silly decisions. Same in China, building new coal-fired power capacity. When the Chinese existing coal-fired power fleet operates at less than 50% capacity utilization, is a waste. Right. I wonder if Laurence agrees, but... Well, let me, let me go to Laurence. I'm, I'm going to come to you, Omran, in just a moment. But Laurence, you wanted to um, respond to that. Yeah, because uh, Julie, uh, Julie is very right. Uh, why, why this inertia? Why, why is really the lock-in into something that, which is irrational from the economic point of view? It's the politics. It's the politics of the state-owned enterprise in mm. many countries. It's a politics of stranded asset people in government are afraid of killing because what do you do with this capital which will be destroyed? And you see, it's a, everything is about expectations. If now the expectation of government and business and investors are saying, well, coal is dead, oil will, be, will come soon, you will see the shift, and then the government will be probably a little bit more courageous to deal with that. But that costs money. When you close a power plant, you have to compensate. Electricity company, for example, in Germany are asking now, even if they are non-profitable, just to ask for more money to stay or even to close down. So it's a really, that's a political economy issue. I do think that the energy issue th these days is mainly about political economy. And they have to find a compromise to buy uh -huh. the stranded asset out and just to to make the space for the more profitable ones to come in. Right, well, that's true, isn't it, Omram? Because, I mean, there are examples all over the world, but if you just take the tensions between Russia and Saudi Arabia, um, how fossil fuels still play a huge part in international diplomacy. No, I, I fully agree with, uh, mostly agree, actually, with everything I heard, but especially what Laurence just said. I mean, one point to think about is, uh, obviously, the international oil companies, Shell, Total, Exxon, they get a lot of attention, rightfully so, because they... They own large portfolios and they have great technologies and so on. 
and they have pressure to, to transition, but they really just represent a small portion of the reserves. And the majority of reserves, the large, significant majority of reserves are still national oil companies. And those national oil companies, as mentioned, they have a responsibility or a duty to fund their governments in many cases, almost entirely. And, and the political economy aspect of it is how, how, how are those companies structurally going to stop operating? They may be more efficient and they may be more progressive and look towards, you know, things like carbon capture and maybe blue hydrogen, and transition fuel and become more focused on gas. But at the end of the day, they have an obligation to extract. And that's, that's, where, that's where the challenge is. That's where it's hard. And, and international companies, all companies and banks have a role because they, they're partners in those a lot of times these companies now are, are sophisticated enough that they don't need any partners. And at the same time, we also have developing countries that are, you know, hoping to uh, to monetize and, and grow their economies. And, and you're telling them not to keep it on the ground. So it is, you know, it makes sense. The economics are making sense in a lot of uh, sectors. The, on, on, on paper, it makes a lot of sense that fossil fuels should not be used in many areas. But when you look at the political economy aspect, as Don said, it's much more complicated and it affects a lot more people than we think it does, as right. I mentioned, the national uh, economy. Do you accept that, Jose Antonio? I know you, you want to look at it all through the eyes and the lens of an economist, but you've got to take these political considerations into account because they're the, they're the block, if you listen to the other panellists. Uh, sure. I mean, I think, I think all of this is true. I mean, I think what Jules said is it's absolutely, it's absolutely true. And, I mean, I think... It's, a, it's, I mean, one, an alternate way of looking of what's been said is the demand side. I mean, as long as somebody wants something, somebody's going to produce it. Very difficult if people have a demand for something for companies not to produce it, whether they're national oil companies or they're private companies. As long as the world demands 100 million barrels of oil a day, somebody's going to produce 100 million barrels of oil a day. So it's a matter of taking the right policies and the politics on to lower that demand of 100 million barrels of oil a day. And when we do that, then companies, slowly but surely, national oil companies and private companies will stop producing that oil to feed that demand. So I think you know an alternate way of doing it is just not thinking about how do we cut the supply of oil, but how do we cut the demand for oil? So I mean, it's... I think we, we all agree that that's what we need to do. And it's hard. And it's difficult because people are displaced. Uh, companies need to shut down, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I agree with you. It is hard. But is it too much of a demand, though, Jose Antonio, on certain parts of the world that perhaps are only just experiencing prosperity or a burgeoning middle class to ask them to make those sorts of choices? No, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to insist that I don't No, you insist away. Mm -hmm. They, they, they. Uh, I don't believe in this, you know, this choice between growth and clean and clean energies. I mean, we've talked about all the issues that about the issues that all the renewable costs have come down, especially in the in the last few years. Jules and Laurence and everybody has talked about investing in the fossil fuel fuel plants of today are stranded assets tomorrow. Well, countries that need to grow can avoid and they can leapfrog investing in these types of plants because the alternative is profitable and uh, and it can be it can provide the energy we need so I don't believe in this dichotomy of growth versus uh, you know versus fossil fuels okay. or being clean growth I mean, I really, I really don't Jules yeah can I build on that because I think it is a fundamental point mm. if you're the government of Vietnam, or the government of Pakistan, or the government of Kenya. Yeah. And uh, because maybe you're on the Belt and Road, the Chinese mm. government offers to build your coal plant, and it comes with some financing. And you're going to think about it, and you realize, oh, golly, I don't have domestic supplies of coal. The cost of this plant is now more than the renewables alternatives. That's the investment of the future. And I'm already dealing with a pollution issue in my cities anyway. The choice seems so obvious. So how do we make sure that decision makers around the world understand this fundamental shift in economics right. that has taken place and then make sensible economic decisions, sensible economic decisions that also benefit their citizens? Right. Well, you answer that question, Laurence. I'll put that to you. How, how, how do you unlock it then politically in that example, um, picking a country like Kenya? 
That, for example, it means that you cannot isolate, and that what Oma was saying, you cannot isolate the energy system from the macroeconomic of a country and the, the tax resources from the government. And that's why it's so difficult, because you have to move the whole system. The, the Sweden has, uh, in a way, just done that transition or is doing that transition because they just reformed totally the tax system. And they now they move from the tax on, on labor to the tax on, on, on really on environment and pollution. Uh, I think that's one very important piece the second is what Jules was referring to, access to capital for a number of countries. Kenya is a good example. India is. The cost of capital, access to capital to invest in renewable energy is, 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 is still very high. And of course, the, the abundant resource still of uh, Japan, for example, or it was still the case for South Korea now decreasing or still China offering apparently cheap capital to build a coal power plant or to invest in gas, for example, when I think about Mozambique, for example. These are really the bad incentive. So uh, I do think that a very important and very difficult issue is the, these developing countries, and I totally agree with Jose, you don't separate growth from clean energy. There is no need from that. The problem is the tax base and the incentive and yes, the international capital markets has to offer really reasonable access for these countries to invest in the, which is more capital intensive in the beginning. Okay. And that's why I think export credit and investment, BRI is a good example, should really focus on clean energy uh, and not, of course, subsidize this energy of the past. All right, well, we're going to develop those um, thoughts, Laurence, in just a moment. Um, but before we move on, a reminder that coming up later, Ethiopian Prime Minister and Nobel Peace Prize winner Abiy Ahmed will be in conversation with Bertrand Badre. Not long now, before that. Um, yeah, let's just pick up on that, um, Omran, because can the finance industry, pension funds in particular, use their enormous investing power to drive the transition to renewable energy? And what about the IMF, World Bank and other global institutions? I think they can. I think they they need to be the key the key driving force because uh, they just will make it not only more expensive to build fossil fuel, will make it more attractive, relatively speaking, to build any, anything clean. And I think that's happening. Uh, and and not only is it happening, it's happening fast. I mean, you see, um, uh, even in post COVID, in the last four months, you see uh, you know ESG related stocks performing better. Um, you see, um, uh, there was a, a poll made by J.P. Morgan where they interviewed uh, 50 global institutions, like 13 billion trillion dollars of assets, and 70% said that COVID will accelerate this. And I think you know the trends are all moving towards that, and I think that you're seeing kind of a, uh, several factors coming in at the same time. We talked about the balance of political and economic and technology, and I think that the finance sector will have to be the one pushing it. But it's now a much easier case to make when it technologies are, are have kept caught up the the costs have come down uh, and, and you know the willingness is there so I think yes absolutely they can and, and I think they will continue to be an interesting point related to that also is is um, is, is the fact that carbon pricing you know we right. mentioned uh, we went back to that earlier there was a, a recent group of CEOs that actually came out publicly in the business roundtable at 200 companies of Amazon and Chevron saying recommending that a carbon uh, price is established uh, and that, that they, they said they need that and they need it for certainty. So it's become really a very different narrative in a very different situation. And really, I think that the driver has been eventually, once the finance uh, sector uh, made that decision, I think everything's moving faster now. Jose Antonio? Still a long way to go, but it, it will play a big role. Jose Antonio, what's your response, particularly around carbon pricing? Well, I mean, I think uh, to build on what, what Omar said and to put in another layer of complexity on this, I mean, one of the issues that we've had is we know if you're going to build a plant, you, you give the plot of land. But issues that have come up repeatedly in emerging economies are property rights on when you're going to put a wind farm in a large piece of land, you will not believe the number of times where you have to shut down the wind farm because the property rights are not correct. And farmers or people who have claims to the land come in and say, no, you can't turn the turbines on until you do A, B, or C. And then the politics gets involved and the electricity, etc. The same thing happens with uh, solar, solar farms. 
because these things, you know, they're not concentrated small pieces of land. They tend to be larger, which is fine. You know, if you have a desert, you know, you can put lots of solar panels, but if you don't have the right land property rights, that becomes an, an issue. So I think, um, you know, as Omar said, uh, Omran said, I'm happy and I, and I agree totally that the finance industry is having a big push. But now, especially in emerging economies, we need to take care of other stuff to make sure the investments happen profitably because, you know, the paid pension funds are not going to invest in wind farms if they have property rights issues. So I think it's, a, it's also an interesting area that we need to, that we need to work on. Well, um, Laurence, the Paris Agreement you worked on predicted 25% of global emissions to be under some carbon pricing mechanism. Has that been borne out? Um, it's coming in a way, but uh, the problem is that uh, the, the carbon price, which is actually used, and it uses in quite a number of countries now beyond Europe, is still very low, uh, under $20 a ton in, in, in the majority of the cases, which we should be for 2030 around 80 something, 80 ton, uh, at least in 2030, or even more uh, by European standard, which would be at 100. Uh, dollar a ton. So we are not there. Uh, that, that's evident. The, the resistance to the carbon price in economies, and I was referring, for example, to the French case, is that it has, for the moment, we haven't avoided to have this a regressive effect on household income. Because the people, of course, who are paying for their fuel for their cars or the heating of their houses, uh, for them, uh, an increase in the price has much more consequences in the term of their acquisitive powers and a more wealthy level of the society. So there is a regressive element in the carbon price we have to address if we want this to be accepted by the society. And of course, we have then to invent or innovate mechanisms that on one side gives the, signal, the price signals that can help the expectation and move the economy, but on the other side address the regressive impact on the income. And that's super important if we want to go further. Second, I think we should think about, it's not only about producing more energy, it's, it's being much, much more efficient to do the same thing. And that's not a good idea just to not to have insulated house uh, or a cooling in, in hot countries that really is not efficient, which is the case now. We're very inefficient cooling uh, devices. So this is a, a whole effort of thinking the system right. Um, Jules, can I um, get you to respond to um, some of what Laurence has said, particularly about the, the, the regressive um, impact and how that's got to be addressed? How would you do it? Yeah, it is, a, it is a fundamental issue and we've seen it in some ways, for example, in France with the yellow vests, which yeah. uh, to some extent emerged because of attacks on, on fuel. Uh, Interestingly, here in the United States, uh, there is um, there has been a discussion, particularly on the more conservative part of the political spectrum, of what is called a tax and dividend system, where everybody who pays a car everybody pays a carbon tax, everybody pays carbon tax on the product that they use, but at the end of each quarter, a check is written to every citizen of the country representing the amount of carbon tax that was collected and then you overcome that regressive nature of the tax that uh, Laurence was describing. The alternative is to go the Swedish way again as Laurence was describing where we are reducing taxes on labor mm. and are replacing it uh, with a tax on carbon. So there are definitely mechanisms around it uh, and it requires savvy pol policy making to find the right solution for an individual country. And what are those uh, sort of savvy policy making um, that would actually convince politicians to take those measures? I think well, politicians are starting to realize <laughs> that the risk associated with climate change is no longer a risk for two, three, four generations down the road, but is a risk of today. And that's driving this, right? Laurence, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I think if you, we want, well, I'm speaking for my own political environment and not for many other political cultures, so it doesn't make sense for certainly other countries like beyond Europe. But anyways, if you want to be politi 
politically savvy, you have to gain the trust of your citizen. To gain the trust of your citizen, you have been really uh, make proof that you care, you really care for where they are. And it could be the, the center of US as well as the West Coast, not only one part of the population, but really trying to uh, address the issues of everyone. And I'm deeply feel that our democracies are in the danger where people don't feel that that government are really taking care of them and listening to them. The second aspect is really to have the public participating to the policy decision. I'm a fan of it. I don't think you can have only top-down decision-making. It doesn't work because it's a system change. You can't have people changing their behavior, making changing their expectation and thinking about the risk of climate change and responses if you don't have them having agency. So agency of citizens for me is one of the main recipe for political savvy solutions. Okay, I mean, Jose Antonio, you might want to respond to that, but I also want to ask you um, about something that's happened as a result of the pandemic, which is a huge decrease in fuel demand thanks to changes in transportation. How much of that do you think can be fed into a sort of long-term economic strategy? And is it permanent, that, that change and that decrease? Well, I mean, I think just to touch on the political it, I think the conclusion of, of what uh, both uh, Jules and Laurent said is that it is very difficult <laughs> to, to do mm. these things because at the end of the day, they're taxes. And, you know, I was the undersecretary of taxes, and <laughs> that makes you a very unpopular person. <laughs> taxes are taxes, no matter how you do them. And if you have to pay more, I agree with you, Laurence, there's a, an issue of trust. But all of this is, all of that is easier said than done. Uh, you know, it, it's a lot harder to try to convince people that they have to pay more for anything. Now, to your question in particular, you know, I'm going to say something controversial, but the pandemic, which has been horrible, has done more than any carbon tax could have done. You know, they lowered the demand for fuel, for oil, 15 million barrels a day. So that's 15% within three or four months. That's not the way, the most permanent and the most constructive way of doing it. But it's a lot. Again, I think we can make it permanent to the degree that we change the relative prices, so that we change the signals, so that we put these things, so that we don't, you know, these things become permanently uh, at a higher price. And then eventually uh, we can try to, the recovery to be slower and we can reach this peak oil demand. And let me emphasize this, peak oil demand is good news because it's not increasing, but it's still 100 million barrels of oil a day. That's a lot more than what the world can take in terms of climate change. The demand for oil has to come down drastically more than 100 million barrels of oil a day. And that, the, the way to make it permanent, again, okay. is through all the issues that we've talked about, politically or uh, savvy policy making on all fronts, on investments, on the financial sector, on taxes. And I think we need to use all of these tools to try to make this lower demand uh, for fuels permanent. OK, well, this is a good point at which to open things up to journalists and editors from around the world. And we're going to start in Kuwait. And if our questioner there could uh, introduce themselves and then pose the question. Thank you. Good evening from Kuwait. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, carbon tax. Both carbon tax and carbon border adjustments may be viable in the developed world. But how can developing countries be expected to implement these mechanisms without impairing their ec economic growth? In short, uh, should the developing countries be given compensation or draw upon a fund for the same? Omran, Thank you. would you answer that one first? I could try. That's a big, big <laughs> question. I mean, that's the, that's the, the biggest probably question, huh? north versus south, or whatever you want to frame it. Mm. But, you know, carbon tax adjustment, I mean, it goes back to demand point. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, for, for countries that are exporters are depending on, on oil and gas for revenue, I mean, they'll have to adjust to the demand the countries uh, that, that are importing. And carbon tax adjustment, carbon border adjustments, I mean, they're eventually going to come in one form or another. I think what, what could be done is it could be done maybe in a progressive manner where you're you're introducing them in a way that incentivizes, you know, for example, lower carbon intensity sources of oil and gas so that you're encouraging those those uh, 
sources, exporters to slowly transition away, or, I mean, or faster, depending on what the need is. But I think there is a role to play. And, and the fact that the energy industry is interlinked, it's not, uh, you know, the, the countries that are importing also have companies that are involved there and so on and so on. So it's, you have to look at it holistically. Um, it is going to be a tough adjustment. Uh, we see it coming in Europe. I mean, you see all discussions around even now uh, methane leakage and, and border adjustment on, on oil prices, and even uh, people like, uh, you know, we never used to speak about these things uh, um, in Saudi Arabia and so on, talking about the need to differentiate between different sources of oil, that some sources of oil are cleaner than others. So that, that indicates that you know, people are responding to that and they'll, they'll be prepared for that. But there's no, there's no other way to, to uh, really um, say it, except there will be a financial uh, adjustment, structural financial adjustment. And that requires, you see it now in, in the Gulf, you see it all over, having to just move away from uh, all kinds of subsidies, having to move or lower uh, payroll and, and government spending and, and being more market-based. So it's going to have a knock-on effect, and it's going to be uh, challenging for all involved. OK, well, thank you to Raven D'Souza there um, from The Times, Kuwait. Um, let's go to Mexico and our questioner there. Hello, can you introduce yourselves and uh, which publication you're from and then put your question? Luis Miguel González from El Economista de Mexico. My question is very simple and very complex. What can we do with national oil companies? Ah, well, who would like to take that first? Laurence? Oh, Jules, Jules, you go for it. Um, yeah, I think national oil companies face exactly the same challenge as international oil companies. If they peer into the future right now, they realize that 20, 30 years from now, their business will no longer be viable, their business will be decapitalized. And the ones that are going to lead are the companies that most aggressively work on the transition. Think back to the world of mainframe computing. How many of those companies are still around? Think back to IBM in those days and how they've had to transform themselves. It's precisely the same thing. But because energy is such a fundamental part of every economy, and there's so much pride associated with national oil companies, we think it might be different there. No, it isn't. These companies have to adjust. They have to adjust incredibly fast. And my money is on those companies that start that transition now. And that is incredibly hard. It's going to require bold leadership from companies like Pemex and others uh, ah. to move towards the future. Well, I saw you raise your eyebrows there. We couldn't move on, Jose Antonio, without putting this to you as you used to run Pemex. So what's your response? Well, I mean, I cannot agree more with Jules. I mean, I think at the, at the end of the day, uh, both national oil companies and international oil companies are going to be facing the same issues. The politics are different, but the end result is going to have to be the same. And like Jules, I agree. Those that can transform themselves and make themselves more efficient and transition faster, those are the ones that will do better. So, yes, I completely agree. OK, well, we'll uh, say goodbye to Luis there in Mexico. And let's go to Nigeria, where our questioner is waiting. Please introduce yourselves and put your question to the panel. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Philip Isakwa. I am the executive editor of Business AM, uh, uh, the economic and financial partner for Project Syndicate here in Nigeria. Uh, my, my question is this. You, African economies, being largely commodity dependent, have been hard hit by COVID-19. The investment environment has thus been skewed by this COVID-19. Are there ways these economies can realign themselves to attract and drive the investment required to scale up renewable energy adoption? Thank you for your question. Anybody burning to answer it before I choose someone mm -hmm. from the panel? I, 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 can, I can try. Uh, I do think we there is choices for the international capital market, the, FI, the development financial institution of this world, to make a really clear decision on what, what kind of transition they would like to engage themselves with the developing countries who need now this capital. And you can have very different decisions. And I think what I see, and I would like to push for, is that a number of these institutions, let's say the European Investment Bank, the World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank and others, 
they, they have really to provide the resources at a reasonable cost again, uh, and in a way address the debt issue which is mounting even in your country, just to say, look, we, we, we invest with you in the right move in the renewable energy, for example, or energy efficiency, or diversifying the economy because the problem of dependency on one source, in particular oil, is super dangerous. And, and you know, of course, all the inflationary effect, et cetera, we, we know all this. So it's a golden opportunity to diversify. Uh, but then the capital market, in particular the public sector, uh, and the development bank has to respond. And I think that's the moment to really ask for consistency between what they do and the commitment for Paris Agreement, for the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a moment where they have to be consistent and respond to uh, the demand of the governments now in developing countries. Thank you, Philip, for your question. We're going to go to Poland, um, where we have a journalist uh, standing by. Do go ahead with your question. Introduce yourself first. Um. Good afternoon. My name is Michal Szczeski. I represent Gazeta Wyborcza. Uh, I'm an editor and uh, I'm responsible for Green Page. Uh, and I have a question which is particularly related to Poland because, uh, as you probably know, Poland has broken out of the plans of the common EU policy on climate neutrality recently. So I'd like to know uh, how do you perceive the role of um, Poland in European green transformation? Thank you. Uh, Laurence, do you want to answer that first as well? Yeah, maybe that that we probably more adequate. Um, I see. Uh, of course, it's it's a question mark for the unity of having the consistency of green deal, and and we are in full negotiation mode now between Poland in particular and the different other government and the Commission to what will be the use of the transition fund, the mechanism, uh, and how much Poland is decided to, uh, in a way, phase out coal. And again, I don't know, but you, you know better because you are living in your country and you know the inside. I see the, the discussion in Poland moving uh, in a much, much, in a very different way. Two years ago, I would not have expected Poland to say, maybe that's the moment we have to decide for a date of phasing out coal. So I think uh, there are now a, a number of people in, even in, in the government of Poland these days that are pushing for electric vehicles, for example, citizens of Poland that are really willing to have a clean air. So where does these compromises would go? I, I don't know still, but I think, I think a sound negotiation between the EU Commission, the other countries, of, offering the space, the economic space of Poland to go for a clean economy, maybe is at the moment of the discussion. And again, I'm not there, and even if I would visit your country very soon, uh, I'm not sure. But but I think the discussion has evolved enormously when I look at what to say your Minister of Economy and Finance or the Minister of Energy. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the coal power plants are not profitable in, in Poland now anymore. So and, and importing coal doesn't make sense either. So Jules, Jules, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I'd like to build on Laurence's last point there. Coal is not profitable. It's not profitable anywhere around the world. Unfortunately, it's also not profitable in Poland. I've been to your country many a time and I'm incredibly fond of it. But the reality is that Poland, for the competitiveness of its economy going forward, has to move away from coal. And the reality is that the last 10 years, the writing was on the wall and your government has failed to take that message and start that transition. So it's now five minutes before 12. Coal does not produce cost effective electricity. Poland has to move. It has to move fast. And in that way, position itself for future economic growth. Jules, thank you. Um, that's all we've got time for in terms of questions. But thank you also to the journalists. And also a special thanks to all of our panellists, Jules Kortenhorst, Laurence Tubiana, Jose Antonio Gonzalez Anaya and Omran al Kawari. Now, before we go, last but very much not least, we're delighted to welcome Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and Bertrand Badre, CEO of Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital. Bertrand, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Joe. Mr. Prime Minister, it's a great honor and it's a privilege to have you with us today to discuss a green recovery on behalf of Project Syndicate and all the team. 
And many thanks for your time and making yourself available. You have been awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, it's a turbulent world where people are very nervous on so many fronts. And I would like you to share with us uh, some messages that you would like to send first to two important leaders in today's world, uh, President Donald Trump and Chairman Xi Jinping in China. Well, our um, generation is um, experiencing uh, historic gains and losses across the world. Uh, technology and uh, wealth are being generated at uh, unprecedented uh, pace. The environment continues to uh, deteriorate as more and more spaces are uh, driven to uh, extinction. Let us not leave a vacuum of leadership. Let us focus on the real problems and our common uh, denominators. My, my big question for, for, for you, Mr. Prime Minister, is to what extent climate change is already felt in Ethiopia? Uh, is climate change a short-term or long-term issue? Well, it is um, definitely a long-term issue. Um, our Green Legacy Initiative, uh, for example, uh, in um, the initial um, four-year target for planting 20 billion seedlings is aimed at uh, engaging citizens to adopt um, a more harness on approach to climate resilience and uh, environment protection. We believe um, through enabling ownership of um, the issue at the household level in the short term, we are uh, paving the path for uh, sustainable uh, engagement on uh, long-term issues. Can you tell us a little bit about your vision on energy? And I'd like also to know whether your vision uh, can be exemplary for the continent, for Africa. Generating energy from uh, modern and sustainable sources is uh, at the core of our development uh, ambition. 95% of Ethiopians uh, use uh, biomass for cooking, and directly uh, competing with animal feed, causing um, indoor pollution and related uh, severe um, respiratory problems. Ethiopian women and girls in particular spend hours every day collecting and transporting firewood in uh, backbreaking work. Our um, prosperity ambition builds on um, a record of 15 years of continuing double digit growth a major um, driver of the growth was uh, public investment in uh, infrastructure. In this period, uh, access to electricity in terms of lighting uh, increased from uh, 27% in 2003 to 45% by 2018. The Convention on Biodiversity, which was supposed to happen this year, has been delayed to next year but biodiversity is becoming more and more an area of focus of the international community. Uh, we'd be very happy to hear your view on uh, conservation in Ethiopia. And do you expect more support from the global community to, to your efforts? The um, Horn of Africa is one of uh, the world's top uh, 35 biodiversity hotspots. Ethiopia is blessed with uh, a rich set of um, the fauna and flora reflecting it's um, a wide spectrum of physical and um, climate characteristics. On uh, the other hand, the demand for firewood, uh, overgrazing infrastructure, population growth, and climate change are uh, threatening our biodiversity. Role of uh, the global community. It starts with uh, recognizing the benefits of our conservation efforts to the um, region and to the world as a whole. From that, would follow supporting our initiatives financially and uh, diplomatically. So the role of development banks and multilateral bodies is um, indispensable. Thank you. T talking about uh, development banks and international financial support, I'm a man of finance. As I said, I've started an SDG uh, fund uh, so far, I'm focused on Latin America, but I have the intention to move to Africa and obviously uh, to Ethiopia. Uh, as I told you in the beginning, I came to Addis last uh, for the Financing for Development Conference in 2015. It was supposed to be a big shift at that time. I'd like to have your views uh, on what happened since. 
And in particular, uh, since the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, it seems that the level of international support has been disappointing, to, stay, to say the least. Uh, do you expect more now? That's my first question. My second is, have you noticed real changes since 2015? And uh, last on that topic, and sorry to group all of this, uh, what do you think of recent finance innovation? In particular, I have in mind the new idea of debt for climate swap, where basically you connect debt restructuring to an effort uh, or to climate benefits. Uh, thank you. One um, approach that should be avoided is uh, subjecting many of these mega problems of um, our times to one approach. Uh, there is no single um, silver bullet suited to all these uh, complex challenges. Aid alone or uh, foreign direct investment alone will not um, advance the climate issue. We need all of them and more together. I believe our approach to the climate agenda should be one that is focused on uh, imagining a new future and uh, attempts to solve um, for justice and sustainability in social, economic and environmental uh, dimensions. Debt for climate swap appears uh, promising for countries uh, to liberate funds and uh, redirect them to environment and climate friendly initiatives. The DFCs should be considered as one of a menu of options where against uh, the particular macroeconomic and broader development uh, realities of each country. I am uh, a strong supporter of um, innovations attempting to address evolving um, challenges. As painful and costly as COVID is, it has only strengthened our resolve and um, taught us to plan smart for an increasingly complex world. It is only a temporary disruption, not a change of direction. COVID-19 has taught us um, that the climate challenge has consequences that are um, inevitable global in effect. After all, supply chains and markets are global. We need unwavering international commitment, national policies and local measures to reduce and reverse our environmental uh, footprint, particularly as our health systems and well-being are closely tied to the environment and sustainability. Hence, I don't necessarily view it, it as um, moving down a pile of priorities, but rather mainstreaming it with an existing priorities. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. I hope I'll see you in Addis um, after, after COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bertrand, thank you very much for that fascinating conversation. Now, that's all we have time for, except to say a huge thank you to all our guests over the past two days. And, of course, most of all, to you, our audience watching around the world. But don't worry, you can still keep the conversation going on social media using the hashtag TheGreenRecovery. I've been Joe Coburn. Thank you for watching.